Hey everyone, um, we're gonna wait for a couple of more people to join. I see lots of people are joining already. Uh, we'll wait a few more minutes and then we will begin and then we'll introduce ourselves. And if any of you want to meanwhile, introduce yourself in the chat box or put any questions in the chat box, we'll, you know, we have our own um, questions and topics that we prepared, but, um, you know, and also some people sent us questions, so we'll be answering those, but we'd love to answer your questions live as well. So we'll be looking at the chat box the whole time. There's a Q and A button on Vadim. You can um, put, put your questions in. So I'll wait one more minute, then um, I'll introduce myself and my co-host. But again, if any of you wanna, you know, put any questions in the chat box, please um, feel free to do so. All righty. Yeah, we'll wait one more minute, it's 9.01. Okay, since I'm a very on-time person, um, we Go will start. And um, I'm Miriam Zeitlin. I'm a, a dating coach, shatrin, and college teacher, and as my family can attest, I live, breathe, eat, everything is, is relationship. So I'm very excited to answer all the questions, talk about this topic. It's my favorite topic. And I hope you're all going to gain lots of great information. And I'll give it over to Rachel. She'll introduce herself. And then we'll start with some of the questions. Hi, how are you? Rachel Burnham. I'm a dating coach, relationship coach. I coach parents, singles. And um, it's my total honor and pleasure to be here. And I'm very passionate about helping singles get to that final destination, as we all know, can be challenging for some, but we believe it's possible. So we're here to help you along. Absolutely. And Rachel has a lot of experience. She's amazing. I love her. She's a really good dating coach, um, if I may say so myself. So um, I guess we'll start with the first question that we have prepared. Let's and go. As, I, as I said, so I see a lot of new people are joining. So if you have any questions, there's a Q&A um, you know, a panel that you could just put your questions in and we'll be answering them throughout the evening. Okay, so I'll ask the first question and we'll, we'll get Rachel to answer. Okay, so the first question is, why is Shidduch dating so scripted? Like why does there have to be I mean, there doesn't have to be, but what, what is this about telling people where to go on dates, how long the dates should be, who plans the dates? Rachel, what do you say about this whole thing about it being scripted? Well, you know, I feel like a lot of people think it's scripted and it feels very scripted, but that's also because they don't have experience on the other side. So I'm going to digress for a second and just tell you a little bit about the um, the years that we spent on campus, my husband and I, as Rabbi Ann Repetson at University of Maryland campus. My husband and I had, have and continue to do a lot of Kirov. And so much of what we were doing was relationship coaching a lot of these singles and college kids through their relationships. And the thing that they would always say is, it's so hard to meet a decent guy. Like, where are all the good girls? You know, why can't someone just like set me up with a wonderful person? Why do I have to like pretend and that I like them, that I don't like them? Are they noticing me? Pick them up. What should I say? How to say it? Like, when's too much? How to go too far? Right? So you don't know what it looks like on the other side, except I do because I was a very big part. I didn't personally date that way, but I was a very big part of their journey and they struggled so much. And whatever pain you think in dating is here, there is so much more pain when things get a lot further than you want to be with the wrong person, let me just say. So the shidduch system in general is set up to protect us, to protect us from getting hurt, to protect us from over-investing, to protect us from getting too close to somebody that's wrong for us, right? To get too deeply involved with someone that even if we're like, you know, falling over so much chemistry, so attracted to really has different values. And those will really create lifelong problems. It's really here to protect us. So I think it's hard to see it when you're in it. And I know it does feel scripted. And we could talk about ways to try to make it feel less scripted and less kind of structured and interviewee kind of um, in that sense. But I think if we can understand what the alternative is, um, and I've seen what that alternative is and how broken people are and how healthy relationships are not coming from that system. Um, unfortunately, the system is, is breaking down further and further to the extent where people don't really kind of date anymore, right? So I don't really want to go into the details of college cult culture, but anyone who knows, you know, most people are like not going on dates anymore. You just kind of meet as groups and all kinds of things happen that oh, you don't want to be hookup. happening. Yeah, It's called the hookup culture, right? Exactly. Yeah. So Basically, you know, we want to avoid that. 
And so I know it might feel a little scripted. Um, I do think that a little scripted is worse than the alternative, but I'm happy to explore ways to make it less scripted. You know, I'm so glad you brought up the flip side of that because I'm actually, as a shatrin, I feel that it's scripted. So I feel like, you know, telling people where to go on a first date, not everybody wants to go to a lounge on a first date. People don't like that. Not everybody wants to go on these long dates. People want shorter dates. People want to be able to plan differently. Um, you know, what number of dates to get engaged. So I hear what you're saying, but I still think that there should be some leeway, like let the singles decide things for themselves. It doesn't have, there shouldn't be any rules. That's well, there's kind of I'm guidelines, saying. right? They should be broad guidelines. And within that, you need to take your personality and your skill set and your strengths and own it. Make this experience your own. I don't believe that a shatran says tell everybody should tell everyone what to say. And this date you should be doing this and that date you should be going there. You need a little guidance. I'm happy to give you a little guidance. But in general, you're going to need to kind of take off the training wheels eventually. So you need to own this relationship. Pick up the call, phone, call her. Ask her if she would like to go out with you, right? This is like of the least responsibilities you'll have when you get married, like the least, right? So yeah. you need to practice actually courting. Courtship is part of a relationship. It's, you know, going after that person, showing interest, asking them to go out. Where should we go? Take Putting some effort to research where to go, right? And make it your own and make it more personal so it doesn't feel as scripted. Yeah, absolutely. It makes me laugh because, you know, as a shatrin, lately I've been encouraging very, very strongly that people should set up their own dates. And what I mean by that is, you know, it became this thing that the shatrin has to set up the dates, coordinate the, the time and the place and everything. No, I tell them, I give the guy, the girl's number. I'm like, here, reach out to her directly. And people can't believe it. Even in the most yeshivish circles, why can't it be like that? The shatran doesn't have to do it all. You know, like you're saying, you know, if you're ready to get married and you want to have a relationship with somebody, court them. That's a great way of putting it. I mean, it's the first the first step. It's the first step of, of communication. When would you like to go out? What's your schedule like? These are the first steps of communication. And it could feel a little uncomfortable and it could feel a little awkward. And it's very convenient to have the shatran there. But one day the music's going to stop. And the guests are going to go home and no one's going to be there. And you're going to have to know what to say and do. So get comfortable now. Exactly. Like, oh, my God, there's no shots in here. What do I tell you? What do I talk about? You know? <laughs> exactly. It's so true. exactly. It's so true. That's great. OK, do you want to read the next question or should I? Um, go right ahead. I don't have that right okay. in front of me. Uh, here's another topic that I feel very passionate about. Why is being honest with yourself so important for dating? And And what I mean by that is like, Sometimes the of uh, singles are dating from a place of where what their parents want them to date or society, but they're not being honest with themselves. How is that detrimental to them in the dating process? Okay, this is this is a very important and intense question. Um, you know, it kind of goes along with like, you know, the Borsalino hat and the brand name Yeshiva and the brand name shoes, and therefore I need to go out with that guy who's learning in that. You know, he comes from that family with that name, from that city, from that yeshiva, or that girl with that money, with that look, right? It looks good on the outside. I'm not going to doubt that that might have been the image you had in mind. I just not so sure what that has to do with marriage and your future or you, exactly. right? So we can get all those things. Like I have people calling me who are getting married for the second time, for the third time. I've never met them before, right? And, and they'll tell me the first time around, I married everything that I wanted. I got everything that I wanted. I said, so what's the problem? I didn't get what I needed. And you cannot keep, hold on to a long lasting relationship without getting your core needs met. And so I think a mistake that a lot of singles make is, especially girls, this is a very girl thing. I want to be good. I want to be sweet. I want him to like me. So whatever he says, I'm going to agree. And I don't want to rock the boat. So I'm not going to say my opinion, even though it's very different than his, right? So we're very agreeable. I'm very sweet. I could be good for him. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be a giver, be a giver, be a giver, right? That's my role, be a giver. And, and what... What's misunderstood is giving is so important in a relationship. But when you're dating, I tell people it's really important to be selfish. And I know that that doesn't sound very popular. But if I'm not selfish about who I am and making sure that my needs are being met hashkafically, emotionally, physically, feeling that someone can hear me, make me feel safe, make me feel accepted, not judged, right? 
if I don't feel that those needs are being met, then when I get married, I'm not going to want to give to this person. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. giving is really important in marriage. But right now we're deciding who to marry. Marry. And part of the whole scripted thing is not to just kind of jump into a relationship and figure out if this is a good idea. The idea is to figure out if this is a good idea first, and then we allow ourselves to get more emotionally connected. So the, that starts with, who am I? What's important to me? What do I stand for? You know, I had a, a mother call me. She's like, I don't know what to do. My daughter, I take her to a shatran and they say, what are you looking for? Learning or working? And she says, I don't know. I just want a mensch. I want him to have a real relationship with Hashem. I want him to be authentic, sincere. I don't care about all the shtick. I don't care about what hat he wears or what yeshiva he goes to. I just want somebody very authentic. And the shatran's like, I can't help you. Learning or working. I need to know. Learning or working. She said, I don't know, right? So this girl's like so confused. She's a very genuine, honest person. And she's being forced to pick a very kind of superficial title because you can have someone who's learning who's not a mensch, right? You can have someone who's working, who spends a lot of time learning and who's like very involved in chesed, right? There's all different kinds of people. So being honest- She with really doesn't care, but what about the people- Some people do really care. Right. No, right. Not, there's nothing wrong with caring. Yeah. This particular girl cared more about his character and what kind of person he was than she cared about if he was working or learning. But I'm saying all of that starts with, who am I? I you know, so often I'm speaking to people and um, they really don't know- they could tell you lots of words of what they're looking for because they've heard it said to them before, but they don't really know themselves. They don't know themselves hashkafically, emotionally, psychologically. And so you're 50% of the marriage. We've got to figure out who we are. But I want to hear your take on it. Yeah, so I agree with everything that you said, but you know, I, I think it is important to actually pinpoint, you know, I was I was coaching a girl and she tells me she's dating and dating and dating a bunch of guys and she's not connecting with any any of them. And then, so, you know, I asked a bunch of questions. We went through everything. And it turns out that her parents want her to marry a learning boy, but she really doesn't. So I said to her, you're not connecting because you're not being genuine. You're not being real. You're dating people who, who you won't connect with because that's not who you are. So I, it is important to really pinpoint, like, of course, everybody wants somebody who's kind and good midos and the good character. That's a given. But what type of lifestyle do you want to lead? Do you want to live a, a cola lifestyle? Do you want, you know, a different type of lifestyle? They're both fine. There's no right and wrong, but you really do have to know yourself. Otherwise you won't connect. So 100%, I, I, yeah. I call it the switch, right? So if I go out with somebody and there's something about them I don't like, maybe I don't want him to be learning or I don't like his look or, you know, I never agreed to this and my parents talked me into it. So as soon as I go out, I just like, I shut off the switch. So I'm kind of there, but like, I'm not really there because I won't allow this to go further. I'm not going to open up. I'm definitely not going to make myself vulnerable to connection. I'm I'm not going to really let, let myself like this person. I've just, I've shut off the switch because I won't allow it. And no relationship could ever develop that way. And that's sad because it could be a great opportunity in front of you. Right. For sure. You really, it's, it's very important to know yourself. Um, I see a, ch uh, uh, a question came into the chat box. By the way, whoever just joined, um, there is a Q&A box. You can um, post your questions. We will be answering the questions live. So um, somebody posted, what if you are going out with someone that checks all the boxes, but you aren't feeling a spark? So here's a great one. I'll, I'll answer first. Um, you have to give it some time. That I, you know, that's important because sometimes people think they, they're dating somebody one, two, three times and they're not feeling anything. It does take time to develop. The more emotionally connected you are, and that comes from being vulnerable, from sharing, from, from you know, really getting deep with the other person, then it, then it builds up the spark. It doesn't happen right away. But if you're dating like for a while and there's no spark, it might not necessarily happen. So you have to give it time, but you don't want to slip it like beyond, you know, I don't want to give a number. I don't like to give numbers, but if you really feel like you did all, you you shared, you were vulnerable, you tried your best to make an emotional connection and it's just not there, then it might not happen. What do you say, Rachel? Yeah, so I'm going to add to that, that people wait for a spark to happen to them and not all sparks happen that way. Sometimes we have to try and make it happen. So for instance, I had a couple that were going out. He's such a good guy. He's everything I'm looking for. But like conversation always falls flat. It's always boring. We always talk about work. So I said, let me ask you, what time of day do you go out late at night? Does he have a tough job? Yes. Do you have a tough job? Yes. 
Do you even have time to like go home and get ready? Not really. So you're both going out exhausted late at night when all you really want to see is your pillow, right? That's not putting your best foot forward. Go out on a day date, on a Sunday, when you're fresh, when you've had the weekend to relax a little bit and come prepared with conversations, come prepared with interesting topics to talk about debates or politics or current events. You have to make some effort. We all, I feel, just kind of sit there like waiting to feel the fireworks. That's very Western. It doesn't work like that. We right. have to put an effort. We have to try. We have to try to open up and be vulnerable, as you said. When we are doing all of those things, the spark has a greater chance of happening. And that may happen and that may not happen, right? But just sitting back and kind of waiting it to happen for it to happen to me may not always happen for everybody. We have to try to put in a little bit of effort. And I do say that that does start sometimes with the guy because he's the guy, he's leading, he's taking her out. So he should try to come prepared with topics, come prepared with an activity, you know, think of something that of, that is of interest of her, you know, kind of move things along a little bit to try to help the spark to develop. Wow. It's so interesting that you said that because I'm going to have to disagree with one thing that you said over there. Go for it. It's actually one of my things that, that, that really drive me crazy about the shidduch system. I believe it's really both of their responsibilities to come prepared with topics of conversation and with things to talk about that I really do believe that it's not on the guy I no, I, don't, no, I, I agree don't with you I do agree with you on that I didn't mean that she shouldn't come prepared with topics she should definitely come prepared as well but sometimes the guy sets the tone he's picking her up he'll start the conversation at times so there's nothing wrong with him starting she should for sure you know contribute and participate as much as she, as much as she can Right, right. Okay, so we do agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because it's it, it became like, I, I get this question all the time from guys. They're like, they must be teaching this in the seminaries or something because the girls are just not you know, being prepared or they're, they're just waiting for me to come up with all the topics. No, it has to be a very balanced conversation. I don't think that they're waiting for a conversation to come to them to just answer it. I think honestly, especially when young daters get started, they're just not comfortable around the guy. And they're just very, like, it gets awkward. And what do I say? All right, I'll just wait for him to say something, then I'll just respond. You're, it takes time to get comfortable. Most people, if you've grown up in, you know, from society, you're not just comfortable with any strange guy. It's not just a guy that you know. It's a strange guy that you don't know. And now you're in a car with him going to some restaurant or some lounge. Like, it's awkward, right? right. So people kind of get, they, they get frozen and they don't know what to do. Right. So, you know, that's a good good segue into the next question that came in. Um, can you share advice on what to ask and share on the first and second date? So that's sort of like a little bit of what you were saying. Yeah. So I usually talk about the different stages of dating and I don't like to give an amount of dates per, you know, couple because every couple's right. in their own place. But I would say like approximately the first bunch of dates, right, would be basic facts, you know, getting to know your family, getting to know your job, getting to know your hobbies, your interests, things you enjoy, things that you don't enjoy, topics that are interesting to you. That would just be what I call just, you know, getting to know you. Those are basic getting to know you. And that would be maybe similar to like a coworker, just kind of to get know, getting to know my coworker. So right? then, to talk like Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, and every couple's different, we move into kind of building a friendship, right? Can we build a friendship? Can I get to enjoy this person's company more? Conversation flows more comfortably. Um, we're sharing things that are more personal to ourselves, not just topics that are like external to us, you know, like, oh, you know, today was the, uh, you know, 9-11 anniversary, right? That has nothing to do with you. It's very nice to talk about because it's nothing personal. But once you start getting more personal about your life and your, you know, things that are really affecting you, that's when we start to open up a little bit more. So right. that's kind of building a friendship. And that's really important because I need to know before I really want to marry this person, do I like them? Before you love someone, do, do I like them? Do I like to be around them? You know, there are times that you might love them more and times you might love them less, but do I like them? Do I like them enough that when we're having a disagreement that I want that their best interest should, that something should be in their best interest because I care about them because they are my friends, right? I want to go to my mother and they, she, he, they want to go to their parents, right? My parents, your parents, right? But if I really care about you, I also want to see you go to your parents. So we're going to be flexible because you're not just my spouse, you're my friend. I care for you, right? So building that friendship is important. And then the th third stage I call just emotional intimacy, which is being able to see if I can open up to this person more than just a friend, maybe like a best friend or even more than a best friend. Can I feel safe to share? Will I be judged? Um, is this person getting to see the real me? Do I feel understood or do I feel like, you know, communication is off and they don't really get me? All of those kinds of pieces. 
typically after that stage, people have kind of in their mind, if that stage goes well, which can take X amount of dates, um, people are typically ready to move into talking about getting married. Um, and then, right, but that's important not to skip that stage. The emotional, very important not to skip, skip that stage. Yeah. Very important. You cannot skip that stage. It won't move forward. I had a guy who couldn't seem to get emotionally vulnerable and he always got to stage three and then all the girls dumped him stage three, dump stage three, dump. And he couldn't figure it out until he came to me and we worked through it and realized he always gets stuck in this stage. Excuse me. He did not grow up in a home that was emotionally expressive. He didn't know how to do it. It definitely wasn't modeled for him. And so we had, I had to teach him. I had to actually role play and teach him how to do it. And Baruch Hashem, he's dating someone, no, very seriously now. So oh, let's, let's, let's wait for good news. That's great. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the fourth stage is the leap, right? So I know you, I'm building a friendship. There's emotional intimacy. Can we actually take this, take this crazy leap into engagement and marriage? And if any of those stages are skipped, there's a problem. And if you get stuck in any of those stages, so the person who can't make small talk in the first, you know, beginning first date or somebody who um, can always get to stage three, but can't pass, get past emotional intimacy or someone who always gets to stage four, but is so scared of commitment, they can't make that leap. If you get stuck in any of those four ways, call your local dating coach. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it's I love the way you put it, the leap, because this is the spot where a lot of people do get stuck. Yes. And, and that, that was one of the questions, like how to get people unstuck. This really is the place where, you know, they go through all the stages, they're ready, but there's something. So you know what I say? If if you went through all the stages and and it's good, you did the emotional intimacy, you did, you know, um, you didn't skip any of the, of the like, for, first, what how we do it is the head stage. It has to make sense. Right. Then you have to really like the person. You have to be emotionally intimate with them. If you go through all the steps, and and everything checks off and you really like each other, you enjoy each other's company. Sometimes you just have to push through because it'll be discomfort. You'll have every excuse in the world why not to do it. But if everything checks off, you 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 should push yourself because for many people, they're not going to be 100% ready ever. So I'm going to add one piece to that. I yeah. find that unless unless we're dealing with someone who's stuck with, you know, emotional traumas or baggage or things that, that went on in their past that were really traumatic, unless that happens, what I find more often is he's such a great guy. I like him so much. We're compatible, hashkafakli, personality, our families are like all those things. But there's some image that I had in mind. I don't know if it's his oh, look or if it's a personality or if it's the way he dressed. There's an image that I have in mind that doesn't match up to the person who's in front of me. And that gap makes us feel very ambivalent. And if we're able to say, this is the same person as your image, it's just in a different packaging than you may have had in mind, but he's the same kind menschloch from attractive person. You just in your mind built up this castle in the clouds that actually doesn't exist because, you know, like I tell people, when when people describe to me their shidduch, have you ever had someone say like, I'm looking for a guy who like has anger management issues or if he's like socially oh, awkward, I'm, I'm cool with that. You know, like if he's financially not stable, like that's fine, I'll take that. Nobody says any of the neg negatives. They only say the positive, right? And we know people are human. We know they have flaws. So we're all the flaws. Why doesn't anyone come to me describe flaws, <laughs> right? So it's called fantasy because you don't have to think about flaws and fantasy. You only have to think about, you know, all the beautiful parts. So all of a sudden you're presented with a real person who has real amazing qualities and real flaws like you, like me, like all of us. And it's like, what's that? I saw a flaw. What's going on? This is very uncomfortable. I, should I dump them because I saw a flaw? I'm like, guess what? They see flaws in you too. And they still want to keep going out with They're you. They're staying with you. Exactly. Are you Exactly. So being able to just kind of shift that, image of what I had in mind and my fantasy and who is in front of me I some sometimes I see closes the gap for people to be able to get engaged you know I love that you brought that up that's that's a great point that the image thing is huge so thanks for bringing that up all right let's move on let me just see there's so many questions here somebody she went on a recent date with a 40 year eight, 48 year old guy from Ohio never married I'm 34 on a shidduch resume it says he's a Belchuva for eight years he's still growing um he didn't wear a kippa. A few days later, I brought it up on the text message and asked him, does he normally, he, oh, um, okay. I'm not sure what the question is here. So, okay. So let's, um, oh, somebody asked, can you share advice on how to choose, choose a shatrin? 
So this is really, you know, somebody that you're able to get along with, to to um, connect with. Not every, it's like a shidduch, really. It is. It, is. it really is like a shidduch. If, if, you know, your personalities have to match, if you can get along with them, if you like the suggestions, if they're not pressuring you, then, you know, any any shot, you can work with any shot. There's no right and wrong for that. As you date and you get to see them and they get to see you, you'll see if their style works for you. You know, and you might have to move on to another shatran. Exactly. Right. Believe me, there's hundreds, thousands of shatran. If one doesn't work for you for whatever reason, you'll find others. You'll find another one. Okay. Okay. How do I develop the skills to discuss uncomfortable topics on dates? Oh, that's a great question. So, wouldn't you say so much of marriage is having uncomfortable conversations with someone that you really like, right? So, so how do we prepare our singles? Right. For that? Exactly. Sweetie, you probably didn't mean to, but like, remember I asked like the socks not be put on the floor and like, you keep doing that. You, you don't realize because like, you're not so mindful of it, but like, it really bothers me. You know, all these uncomfortable things, finances and, and whose job it is to, to change the dirty diaper. All these things are, are not comfortable, right? And we can get obviously more uncomfortable, but we, we could stop there. Um, so I think it's an important skill. It's part of healthy communication. So there's a great book that I like called Fierce Conversations. And Fierce Conversations is all about, it's not for dating, it's for any conversations. It's all about the conversations that could change your life if you had them properly. And the conversations that if you don't have them properly will change your life in a different direction. So for example, should we have another baby? Can I get a raise? Will you marry me, right? These are all big conversations that are life-changing if you have them properly, right? And if you're too scared to ask for the raise or you're too scared to ask the girl to marry you, or you know you think your husband's gonna say no to the, another baby, that will have a very significantly different outcome. So it's really teaching you you know, ways in which to do that. And one thing that they use, cause I recommend the book, so mm -hmm. you should definitely go get it. But um, one thing I do recommend is, you know, Mary, I'm gonna test it out on you, okay? Oh boy. <laughs> Mary, would you like to have an awkward conversation with me? Oh, for sure. It's yeah. going to be awkward. It's even going to be a little bit uncomfortable. But if you know in advance that it's going to be awkward and I know that it's going to be an awkward, we can kind of get the awkward out of the way and we could just jump in. Okay. So um, I don't know, you know, we'll make it up. So, you know, I, I, I thought that you said we were going to speak at 930 today and all of a sudden it's nine, like what happened? Right. But because I prefaced it with, this is going to be an awkward conversation. You're prepared, you know, it's awkward and it got rid of the awkward. We got the, we front loaded the awkwardness and now we could just have a conversation and people start to giggle. Like that's so silly that you brought it up that way. And everyone kind of relaxes a little bit. And then we can just have the conversation or we can start off by saying, listen, I have a lot of respect for you. And I really want to have an, a, a conversation that might feel uncomfortable, but I think that if we can have it in a respectful, mature way, that if we get to the end and we get to a healthy outcome, I think that that will, you know, bring our relationship closer and make us feel more comfortable with one another. Are you ready for something like that? So invite somebody in as opposed to just like, why did you do that? Why did you say that? I'm so uncomfortable when you, right? Right. Like, give a little introduction to a it. A little yeah. introduction. You know, like, you know, we never come home and say, by the way, honey, I smashed the car. First, you give him dinner, you know, and then you talk about it gently. Drunk, and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, right. There are ways in which there's always a nice way to say everything. And there's always a way to not make someone feel attacked or judged, but to invite them in to a vulnerable conversation that's uncomfortable and do it together as a team, as opposed to me against you. Right. Another, like a little bit of a different twist on this is, is sharing not necessarily uncomfortable, but vulnerable stuff. Like when you're dating, you have to share. So also like you can start by saying, you know, I want to share something with you that I usually only share with a very good friend or a very close friend. Like that's also telling the person that what I'm sharing with you now is something, you know, personal, private, vulnerable, it's, it's a different type of conversation, but it's also giving an introduction. So that that's it, another way. I love that. So it's uncomfortable for me to share this with you, but I want to share it with you because right. I want to open up, right? So that gives like a sense of exclusivity where I believe that you're someone who can handle this information I'm sharing with you and not with other people. That, sh that creates connection. Right, right. That's perfect. Okay. How do I deal with feelings of shame for not meeting my basher? Any advice? Oh, that's horrible. I, um, you're probably better equipped to, to answer this. I, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here. Yeah, yeah, I think I will. Uh, so as and the reason I say that is because, you know, I got married, you know, very young and Rachel had a little journey. That's, that's what makes her 
such a fantastic coach, by the way, because she gets it. So go ahead, Rachel. So I'm just going to share my story um, very briefly. I was single for 14 years. I dated hundreds of guys on thousands of dates, um, got married at the age of 34, Baruch Hashem, to uh, number 220. For some reason, people find that little piece of information fascinating. Um, and the- I can't believe you didn't lose track. Oh, I had a book. Oh, okay. I had a flow chart. I'm not even kidding. I'll tell you about it later. Anyhow, yeah. um, the thing that I think is, you know, that journey was very, very painful and very exhausting and very draining. Um, and the story that I think is kind of fascinating for people to just hear is that my husband had been married previously. He was married for 10 years. His wife was very sick. They never had children. He thought he would never have children. And um, she passed away at the age of 30. And I was the next girl that he dated. So he was just unavailable. He was simply not available. And the amount of ridicule, the amount of shame, the amount of put down that I got from family, from friends, from Shad Khanim was so profoundly despicable that if there wouldn't have been a Kaddish Baruch Hu running the show, I don't know that I would have survived. Um, and I always just tuned it out because I just had my eye on the goal. I know that I am marriageable and I'm going to find him. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I believe that a Kaddish Baruch Hu could do it a lot better than I can. So I'm just going to keep my eyes moving forward. And I used to just say like one word, I'd be like, next, next, just keep moving forward. Next, I'm not looking back. I'm just moving forward. I would give myself a very short amount of time to cry over a, you know, a painful relationship. And then I was out the door again another date moving forward. That's what worked for me. Not that that works for everybody. Um, and the important thing to know was Shad Khanim and, and, and family and friends who really do mean well, they really do love you. And because they're uncomfortable, they don't know what to do and they don't know what to say. So maybe I'll blame it on you. I'll blame it on your weight. I'll blame it on your traveling the world. I'll blame it on the fact that you're not dating enough. You're dating too much. You're too from, you're not from enough. You're too tall, you're too short. Like I can give you all the reasons why people had, people walked into my VART saying, I can't believe it. We never thought you were getting married. Can you imagine? Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. And I said, Baruch Hashem, Hashem runs the world. I'm so glad. I didn't say, thankfully, you know, you don't run the world. But, you know, we have to really be so strong. And it's so difficult because being single, you're already in such a vulnerable position because you're reliant on Shad Khanim and you're reliant on family and friends to set you up. And you don't feel like I have a standing in the, in society, so to speak. But, you know, there was, a, there was a whole article recently in Jewish Action, I think it was Jewish Action, um, about the single girl who felt so lonely and there was no place for her in the shul and the society and, and how the shul didn't accommodate her. And, you know, it's a little bit, I, I hear where she's coming from and I have a lot of sensitivity to it. At the same time, we also have to go out and make a place for ourselves. Instead of allowing people to shame us and put us down and pressure us into things right. we don't want, you need to go out, volunteer, you know, help out in your show, um, do chesed, get to know people. And the more they get to know you and love you, the more they're going to set you up, right? So we can't just sit back and, and just kind of sit there absorbing all the negative comments that everyone's going to make. You know, I remember a relative saying like, we were talking about some political debate or current events debate. And I was just putting in my two cents because I was an adult and it had nothing to do with dating at all. And they said, you know, when I see a ring on your finger, then I'll hear what you have to say. Right. It, so it, it's my I, was in my, I was in my thirties, right? Like I don't have an opinion. Like I don't have an educated adult opinion, but, but people will say, do all kinds of things because they're uncomfortable and they don't know what to do with the uncomfortableness. It's like a shiva call, right? So we're uncomfortable. So we just say dumb things. And so they're uncomfortable and they really love you and they don't want to say, so they say things that are very not helpful. <laughs> but, um, but I want to add something. I, I think it's great. Uh, two, two things you said, you, uh, you know, keeping your eye on the goal. I think that's the key. Just keep your eye on the prize, keep your eye on the prize. But I want to add something to this. Why does, why do you have to feel shame about being single? I don't, I don't understand that. You're a person, you're, you have a life, you're successful. Why is there shame? Like, why why do you have to, you know, why does your identity have to be mixed up with whether you're single or married? No, it doesn't. You're right. And there are certain pre per people who are going to say, listen, I have a great job. I have tons of friends. I do lots of chesed. I travel the world. I have money in the bank. Like, I, I love Hashem. I, like, I'm a growing person. I go to Shiram, right? I don't need to be judged by other people. But, right. but when you're going to shul 
and every Shabbos, and you're, even if you're not going to show, you're walking down the street and you're seeing couples and families with children and it's Simchas Torah and it's Purim and it's Pesach and it's Sukkot and we're coming up on Rosh Hashanah and it should be a time where everyone is looking forward to spending time together as family and you don't have your cell phone and you don't have your car and there's nowhere for you to run and there's nowhere for you to go. It feels like I stand out like a sore thumb. Like I, right. you know- So I understand the pain. I understand the pain and the loneliness, but why shame? That's because the, the look that, that you get from people. They feel like right. you're being shamed. Even if people don't realize it, it's like, I never, I, those feelings are just so pity, pity, pitying and uncomfortable. And I used to laugh because, you know, I was, I was, uh, I'm an occupational therapist and I was working in a hospital and whenever I would go to work, everyone would be like, oh, you're so young. You're 30. You're so young. You're so young. And I go to a wedding the same night and I'd be like, I, what's gonna be with you? No, I really, never, really. You understand? I went from young to old within the same twenty four hours, right? So it's maybe the perceived shame, or you haven't made it, or what's wrong with you, and you can't seem to attract a guy, or you can't seem to attract a girl. There must be something wrong with you. What's wrong with you? Let me try to figure it out. So you feel shame, like people are judging you. Like if you were struggling, and if someone was struggling in a marriage, right? I, I wouldn't shame you. I wouldn't even know about it, but I certainly wouldn't come over to you and say, so how was that fight last night with you and your husband? Right. You, you, you don't, see us? <laughs> you don't seem to know how to communicate. Like when you'll learn how to communicate, then you'll get along with him. Nobody would say that because nobody would know that. Right. right. But so I guess it's like, public. Everybody knows about it. Exactly. Okay, I hear, exactly. I hear. But so the main thing is the, the two points that I got from this is keep your eye on the goal and believe that it comes from Hashem. So those, those that's great advice. And I'm just going to add one more little tidbit yeah. that people complain a lot to me about the dating process. And we talked about that a little bit before. Right. No one's really interested in stating, staying in the dating process long term. And I know it's not comfortable, but we have to focus. That's not the goal. The dating process is not the goal. Marriage is the goal. Right. So that's just the means that we have to get there. Thanks so if we could it. focus on, we've got to get through this dating process so we can get married. And then you're not going to be dating anymore, right? right? Of course, it's uncomfortable. It's going to be always uncomfortable. So we find that right person. And, you know, you will always reject or be rejected to every single person that you date, except for that one person you marry. So that's a lot of rejection that you're giving or getting, right? It's uncomfortable. But that's how we find that one person that we marry. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good point. All right, let's move on. Somebody's asking here: Is it a red flag if the person, if the guy doesn't spend too much? For example, he only likes hanging out in the car, doesn't put effort into planning the dates, or is that just him being comfortable? So, go for it, what? Go for it. Yeah, yeah. I was going to answer. So, I don't know about it being a red flag, but it's you know. I always say dates don't have to cost money. There's so much that you can do that don't cost a lot of money. You could go to, you know, nice walks in the park. Um, the, you know, you could go to free museums. They have sometimes you could, there's a lot of things that you could do that don't cost a lot of money. Just hanging out in the car and doesn't put effort into planning dates. I'm not going to say it's a red flag, but it's certainly like, I'm wondering, like, what does he want? Like, does he want a date? Does he want to, like she used the word before, court you? that it's a little bit interesting. So I would, I would definitely um, proceed with caution and, and, and maybe ask, I don't know, to me, it is a little bit interesting because dates don't have to cost a lot of money. So, you know, that's something, what do you think, Rachel? So I don't really care where he takes you and I don't care how much money he spends on you, but I do care about the effort. You need to try. Okay. Because marriage is going to take effort effort to take out the garbage when your wife needs and effort to get up for the baby when they're crying and effort when you need something that they might not want to do because it's uncomfortable and it's three in the morning and you're nine months pregnant and you need them to go to the grocery store for, you know, a turkey. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so I don't like that. I'm not seeing the effort. I don't care so much about how much they spend. So the question is, are they lazy? Are they tired? Are they just not creative and they can't come up with ideas? You know, so I don't know what that is. Um, but it doesn't feel comfortable for a girl when someone doesn't put effort into getting to know her, at least initially, this is like, exactly. should be the most exciting time of getting to know someone. You should put in your most effort now. You should be on your best behavior. Your this, best behavior your best and your behavior most effort. Gonna be when you're married for 10 years, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're going to take you out on a date when you're married 10 years. If he hasn't taken you on a date, even when you were dating. <laughs> exactly. it's, it's, it's a little bit interesting to, to say the least. Okay. Agreed. What about if there's something about my life that is so specific that I feel that either I should not bring it up sooner, I should bring it up and use it as the biggest filter. I'm a foster mom, have adopted a special needs child and want to adopt more special needs children. 
So she's asking, like, if I have something big, should I disclose it early on? And like, if he's well, if he can't deal with it, it'll filter it out, or should I save it for later? Okay, so she herself is a foster mom. I, I it just says I'm a foster mom. I'm reading, by the way, I'm reading the questions from the chat. If anybody else has questions, a lot I see a lot of questions. So I'm I not mean, sure. I I doubt that people aren't going to know that when looking into her, right? right? right. So if, if someone's divorced or if somebody has children already or a foster mom, like those things people people probably have heard of, right? So that is its own built-in filter right there. Right. So I guess I guess right what you're saying, but let's let's answer the first part of the question. Now, not specifically for this scenario. In general, you know, we had another question here about, uh, and I'll I'll segue it into this about, you know, how should you respond if somebody tells you they're on either anti-anxiety or antidepressant medications? So it's the same type of, of idea. Should you disclose this stuff early on or wait till later in the dating process? What do you think? So this is a very delicate topic. Um, and the funny thing is, is that so many people are so worried about disclosing, but the other person's also sometimes- Everybody's on it, right? Everybody's got something today yeah. to disclose, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. So it's like, why doesn't my therapist speak to your therapist? And if they like the idea, you give me a call, we'll go on a date. You know? <laughs> I love it, the agents, right? Exactly. So, I mean, I really think that if you want to have a fighting chance, honestly, you should really go out and try to see if you could build a little bit of a foundation of a relationship. Right. right. It's like building a house. First, you pour the foundation. You got a solid foundation. Then you could put something a little heavier on it. Most people are not going to say, sure, I want to go out with a guy who's on antidepressants or sure, I want a girl who's on, you know, anti anxiety. So if I know them and I like them and I'm attracted to them, you know, most Rob Bunham will say date four or five is an appropriate time to disclose something like that. And I don't know that it's necessary for every person you date to know all of that information up front. Um, especially people are calling around about you. Not everyone feels comfortable with that. So it is fair and appropriate, I think, in today's circles to share that kind of sense of information. Fourth, 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 fifth date, where I've developed a little bit of a relationship. I'm ready to put something. I feel the relationship is good at this stage to handle something a little heavier, but I'm not waiting till like engagement to dump a bomb on them because that would be really disastrous. Right. So this is this is in general something big, but I want to specifically talk about the medication piece because I feel it's important. A lot of people are taking medications and the fact that they're taking the medications, that means that they're acknowledging they have an issue and they're working on it, as opposed to people who are not taking the medications, not doing the things that could be helpful to them because of stigma or because they're not acknowledging their their issues. So I don't think it's such a big deal, you know, if somebody discloses something like that, it shouldn't be an automatic deal breaker. That's 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 what I think. But so, obviously you have to look deeper and make sure, but you know but there's a spectrum, right? There's sure, a spectrum sure. of like mild ADD and severe ADD. And, you know, there's, there's, as an occupational therapist, I, I work with these kinds right. of things all the time. So there's a very wide spectrum, but yes, I would agree that if somebody is aware of what is going on and they're aware of their condition and they're actually taking care of it um, and they're functional to me, being able to hold down a stable job, they have stable relationships they're I don't know, have their own apartment. Like they're showing that they can be functional in society. That is a huge tell right there. So that is going to be, you know, very important. Um, and then it's true. It could not be a big deal to you or to me, for, but it is also the right of the single to say, I'm really not comfortable with this. Right. A hundred percent. But I'm saying it doesn't have to be an automatic deal breaker. It doesn't sure. have to be, an automatic to be deal breaker. you know, they have to be functioning. Of course, or everything that you just said, that's a, a, that's a given, but I'm saying to so many people like automatically, Oh, he's on anti-anxiety meds. Like, forget it. it. It doesn't have to, he could be functioning and, and he could be a great husband, a great person. I just, I don't want people to automatically write people off just because of that. that, I, that I will point okay. out that, you know, I, I happen to be like on the side, just kind of have a significant interest in like health and nutrition and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And a lot of the foods that we eat today that have a tremendous amount of dyes that have a tremendous amount of sugars and everyone's watching way too much screen time, not getting enough sleep, all these kinds of things actually produce anxiety and depression in the brain. 
So a lot of a lot of these people, when they find that they're willing to, you know, exercise more, sleep more, get off their screens, you know, um, eat more nutritiously, get off all the sugar, all the dyes, all the white flour, they find that they're able to wean themselves off of a lot of these medications. So right. not all of them are like, oh, he's so ill, he's so sick. It's right. you know, society doesn't have the best eating habits, and we could actually get better at that and often wean ourselves off of it. You know what I'm saying? So right. absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a very yeah. important point. It, it alters the brain chemistry. Absolutely. Somebody just posted a, a, a question that I really have to read. How do I convince my mother that someone is not for me? She really believes he is. Now, this is something that drives me crazy. You have to remember that you are the one marrying them, not your mother. So if your mother's trying, and it's not only the mother, it could be the mother, the father, the dating coach, the shatrin, the rabbi, your friends, anybody. If anybody's pushing and you just know in your gut for whatever reason that they're not for you, you don't let anybody pressure you. Your mother may like him, but then she can marry him. You know, if you don't want, that's it. No pressure. I don't believe in that. I can't agree with you more. I'm just going to add that sometimes it's exactly what we're looking for on paper. And it's the exact right person, family, Ashkafa, everything is so great. And we have such a hard time saying no, because he's such a great guy. And she's such a great girl, but it's great. But it's not great for you because something about it is not pulling you there. And if you can so easily say like, if my friend got engaged to, you know, got engaged to her, like, or him, I, I'd be fine with that. It doesn't really bother me. I'm not really pulled here. I don't really look forward to going out at all. Those are signs that, it could be a very good person who from the people looking on the outside, see a good person and you agree, but you're just not connected to them. You're not feeling it in that way. And that's okay to say no. Exactly. Don't don't exactly. jump into anything being pressured 100%. And that's part of the stages, by the way, because the first stage that you said it, it's it's good on paper is, is what we call the head stage. Correct. You have to get past the head stage. You have to get to the heart stage, the emotional stage, enjoying time together. All well, that's important. And if not every, not all the pieces are there, it could be great on paper and your mother may love him or her. I don't know who wrote it, but right. um, um, okay. So let's see what other questions do we have? Can you share advice on what to wear for the first date? How fancy should he get dressed up? Thanks. <laughs> That really depends on your hashkafic and cultural norms of where you live. You know, if you're living in, uh, you know, Flatbush or Five Towns, like things are going to be a little fancier. You know, I live out, out here in Silver Spring, even though I grew up out of town in New Haven, Connecticut, and then lived in Flatbush for 20 years. Um, and you're moved, still a Flatbush girl. Can't but, take it but, but you know what? I live in Silver Spring and you'd be surprised what people wear around here on dates. You know what I'm saying? Like I see dates going around all the time and I'm like, oh my gosh. But you've got to do what you feel comfortable. And I think more importantly, is don't try to just put on a show that is a show to be put on for everyone else. If you feel that this is something you would never, ever wear, right? So if you're going to buy an outfit that you are you would never wear in the street because everyone says this is what you have to do and it doesn't really represent who you are at all, let's not pretend to be someone that we're not. This is, this is not going to be helpful. Exactly. But I, I want to add to that as well that you could, if you're going through a chatrin, ask the chatrin to find out like what type of um, dress code or you can ask the person directly because I've had dates where, one was overdressed, one was underdressed, and they were both uncomfortable. So it's it's okay to ask about it beforehand as well. I mean, I've had guys who, yeah. you know, took me on very, very long walks and hikes, and I was wearing like three inch heels, and they just oh, didn't so bother funny. to say anything, yeah. you know? So it, it also, it's also helpful to find out like who the boy is and where he's from. Is he from out of town? Is he from Lakewood? Does he come from a home where a certain expectation is the norm? You know, just to get a sense could be helpful to the girl. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. So um how do i develop this oh no we did that question how do i deal with someone who doesn't have the best social skills but i really like them what do you what do that you think about is that? a hard one yeah i know i'll tell you why because i work with the autistic population i work with a lot of um you know middle schoolers uh, on the spectrum and in my dating coaching practice you know, and, and in, in the school system, majority of my clients are men. And in my dating coaching practice, majority of the complaints that I get are about the social skills of men. So oh, it's, God. it's, it's very, it's a very hard thing. So here's what I could say, you know, when we have a spectrum of, let's say, let's say I give you a number line zero to 10, right? This, my social skills are, are a 10. Are his social skills like a nine 
or his social social skills like a two. If his social skills are like the two, a two, the gap between a two and a 10, it's probably not going to be able to work for you. Okay. But if your social skills are just super polished and he's just like not quite as polished as you are, not quite as savvy or not quite as intuitive as you are, that's okay. That gap can be bridged. The gap between, you know, eight to 10, seven to 10, you can have a lot better social skills. He might be a lot more intellectual than you. You can be much more street smart. He might be much more able to, you know, fix things around the house that you would never be able to fix out or tech savvy, you know? So there's different kinds of smarts and social skills is a type of smart. So when people say, I need a smart guy, I always say, define your smarts. What do you mean? Do you want him to be socially intelligent? Do you want him to be emotionally intuitive? Do you want him to be intellectual? Like what, what are we talking about? Right? So if we're able to say, I really like him and I'm a little stronger in the social skills and he's much more strong in the learning skills or intellectual skills, and I could still find what to like and respect about him, then it could work. And if it's working, you might want to say things like, you know, I really appreciate when you or I so liked it when you did that. Like point out the right. things teach that you him, enjoy. Teach him what you teach like. Exactly. Him. He needs a little bit of help, right? And he'll help you with like, okay, so I know you keep getting stuck in the computer and you can't find the this and this email. Let me show you what to do. He'll teach you too. So marriage is like a series of blending your world together where I learn from you and you learn from me and together we become this new entity of we, right? So we can bridge the gap. But we also have to be mindful that some gaps are too large to, to bridge. Right. Yeah, I love that. The, 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 and, and it's funny because somebody wrote on, on the chat over here, do you think he should be your intellectual match? So this is like you were pretty much answering that question. There, there, there can't be too wide gap. Otherwise, it won't work. But you don't exactly have to be the same. But you also have to know what works for you. What, what are you comfortable with? If you're a lot more intellectual or if you feel much smarter than him and you won't be able to respect him, that might be an issue for you. You have to be able to have a functional conversation. You have exactly. to be like stimulating. But if I am a little more intellectual or he is a little bit more social or more or less, that is typically workable. Yeah. So, but, but I love that point that in it, it, it whether it's with social skills, intellectual, anything. anything as long as the gap is not too large with Hashkafa also, it's the same thing. Yes. Nobody's exactly on the same page Hashkafically. As long as the gap is not too wide, you know, you, you, can, make, you can make things. Well, men and women in general don't express their Hashkafic, you know, ex they don't express their Hashkafos externally the same, right? That's so true. You know, a girl who's working on herself might, you know, take on Shamir Salashon or she might daven Myriv or, you know, she might lengthen her skirt, right? But a boy is going to focus on his learning or going to chakra. So you're not going to be working on the same things together. They're, men and women are, are different. <laughs> They're just different. Right. Absolutely. That, that's a good point also. Somebody wrote, does one have a chance at marriage if you have a slight disability? So I'm not sure what she means by disability, but 100%. Of course. People with all sorts of disabilities are getting married of and course. all sorts of, of issues and 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 not, not everybody's perfect. So 100%, people with disabilities get married all the time. I just Absolutely. did a wonderful um, podcast last week, last week with um, this wonderful woman who uh, has a program where she coaches young um, men who, uh, have, who are on the spectrum and who really want to be married. And, you know, something we talked about was that we all have a disability. Some of it is math. Okay. Sometimes it's, That's I can't life. figure out how to yeah. use zoom, you know? Um, and some people is I, I have a lisp or I have a walking, I have a, I have, a, I have a, a limp, right. Or I have a learning disability. We all come with something. Some of it is more external and some of it's more internal, but know that we all come with something. We just have to find the person that is comfortable taking our shortcomings our disability 100%, 100%. and and you can live a beautiful life yeah um another question Sybil. what if someone has mental illness that was worked on can they get married absolutely we spoke about this a lot of people you know married people have have some sort of mental i don't want to call it illness but you know some sort of things that they're struggling with. So if it's worked on a hundred percent you can get married it's like what I said before if you're aware of the issue and you worked on it 
A hundred percent. I not- think when we're in our bubble of being single and we see our issue, whatever it is, disability, ch- challenge, mental illness, we yeah. think that we're the only person in the whole world that has this challenge and that everyone out there in the dating world, they, they're they perfect. They've got it right. And I have something wrong. But if you find someone who also has something maybe a little bit different than you, then they're strongly with. And you're like, you know what? I find taking, you know, you have a little bit of an anxiety disorder. That's okay. I have a little bit of a learning disability. Okay. You know, we'll we'll help each other. We'll work together as a team. It's not about two perfect people, right? I could be imperfect, and you could be imperfect, and we could be perfectly imperfect together, happily. Right? Tongue twister. But you know what? Besides for that, you don't only have to focus on your disability. What else is there? You know, I'm sure you have lots of great, amazing qualities. You you are not only defined by your disability, and this is something like I said before, but the single status. You're so much more than that. So don't focus only on your, you know, disability or your mental illness. Focus on your positive qualities, because if you're focusing on your positive, other people will as well. You know, so- when you're when you become a parent, Marissa Sham, hopefully uh, you listen to the Zoom and you just meet the right one and you become a parent, you'll realize that children don't need their parents to be perfect at all. They wouldn't care if a parent had a disability. What they need is for their parents to be loving, for the parents to be present right? For the parents to be there for them. And, and as a, as a mother or as a father, those are things that are going to go far beyond whatever disability a person has. If you have a kind heart and you want to be loving and giving, you can use that in so many ways to help your relationship that, you know, you'll see don't really affect your long-term marriage. Maybe they affected your, your school age years, which I am sure like a learning disability or mental illness definitely did. But if you're able to, you know, be right, right, functional on, on some level and be able to hold down a job and hold down relationships, then there's no reason why you can't be successful. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Somebody wrote over here. She always comes neat and clean, but she doesn't paint her nails. She doesn't wear heels. She doesn't dress up much. I asked her and she tells me she's going to try to change. Should I believe her? Is she really going to change? You know, I, I say you can't change somebody. If you're dating her and you don't like that she doesn't paint her nails and wear heels, then she might not be the right one for you because that's not her. You you can't date somebody and marry them expecting to change them. That's that's not how you go into marriage. Yeah, I also like that she's trying to be authentic to who she really is. That's just not who she is. It just exactly. isn't. So she doesn't want to put on a whole show and then a guy is going to expect that show and she only did it for dating and then he'll be all disappointed. She's like, this is who I am. I like being you know, minimalistic. I like being simple. And if you don't like that, then maybe we're, you know, not a match. Exactly. And I want to bring up another point on this is she said she is willing to change, but if you're changing yourself just because you think that the person you're dating, that's what they want, then that's not right. Also, you shouldn't have to change yourself for anybody. Obviously you can change your character and become a kinder, nicer person. That's a different thing, but if that's not you and you're not comfortable with it, you don't have to change yourself for anybody. That's that's not genuine. 100%. Okay, how do you discuss financials and second marriage dating when there is kids and how should a couple deal with it after marriage? What do you say? I, I know a lot about this topic. Yeah, well. um, <laughs> so, you know, obviously it's going to depend on, uh, you know, the couple themselves and what they feel comfortable with and what are the financials, you know, going along. But um, something that I just recommend to couples is make a list of the top 10 financial needs that you have, whether or not it's tuition or a vacation or rent or bills and prioritize them according to what is most important to you. And you should be both doing this, make a list of the top 10 financial goals or, or financial requirements that you, um, uh, responsibilities that you have and, and see if you number it similarly, because to me, a vacation might be very, very important every single year to you. You don't need a vacation. You just want to make sure that you always have, you know, a new outfit in your closet for a yontif. You know what I'm saying? To him, he wants to have a piece of steak for me, for, for Shabbos or, or for yontif. He can't be without it, right? So we we tend to fight about these little things, not realizing that for that person, that's number one. That's really important. And if we could talk about it beforehand and have a conversation about expectations financially, we can really dodge a lot of uncomfortable, awkward situations later on. And I tell I tell guys um, and girls, but specifically guys, uh, you know, 
to have this conversation when they're looking into a girl and ask what are her materialistic expectations and what are her materialistic needs. So I break it down into, is she very low maintenance? Is she kind of average maintenance? Is she high maintenance? These are important things for someone to know, because if I feel like no matter how hard I work, no matter how much money I make, I'll never be able to take care of her then I'm not looking for that kind of girl. I'm an out-of-towner. I want a simple girl. Then you should be dating that that five towns girl who's not going to be satisfied, right? right? So do you think it's important to actually ask the questions and it's sure. not something that you like just, you know, learn about the person through the dating? So I do recommend that people ask about this in research beforehand. Now, mm-hmm. once you, oh. when you're researching the person, once you're on the date, obviously you want to get to know them and you want to get to experience them, right? Obviously that is true. And they're typically always the savers who marry the spenders, right? You know what I'm saying? That's that's like a funny thing that Hashem does to does to us typically. Um, and so- like One likes it hot, one likes it cold. Always exactly, the exactly. And that's how Hashem made it because he wants us to learn to work together. That's the point. It's so frustrating. He always wants the window open. I want it closed. That's the point. Now work together, right? So if we could, instead of get on- getting uncomfortable with it, just kind of, you know, preempt it by discussing it up front. And, and I, I recommend that couples have like what I call like your like little stash savings account, right? If you take a hundred dollars a month, you put it aside and you could save it or you could spend it, but no one can tell you how to use it. You want to buy a pair of shoes? That's fine. You want to buy an expensive pocketbook every 10 years? That's fine too. You'll have a little freedom to just do your own little thing. And he wants to go buy, you know, I don't know. My husband's obsessed with farm, you know, so everyone can, everyone can do their own, their own thing without getting uncomfortable, without getting upset. It just makes it easier when we could like manage the expectations. That's a great idea, by the way, to each have their own thing. Okay. Um, it's starting to get late. So we'll answer two more questions and then we'll, we'll close up. So how do I get people to look past that? I come from a divorced home, even though I live in a totally functional setting. So many people say no upon hearing the word. So this is very unfortunate that people, it's not only about divorced homes, it's about a lot of things. So I want to just give you a little chizah. People may be saying no to you, but the right one in the right time will not say no to you. So I know it hurts. I know it's frustrating, but hang in there because the right one will say yes to you and it won't matter what type of home you come from and they're going to love you for who you are. So don't let it get you down. I call it a natural filter. Right. So now we filtered out all the people that we know for sure are not for you. If he cannot accept that you're from a divorced home, which, by the way, unfortunately, there are so many people today that are from a divorced home that there is lots to choose from. Um, uh, You know, unfortunately, that that's the case. But if he cannot handle that one detail, we don't have to date him and waste any time getting to know him. So it's a natural filter. The people that you are going to be dating are going to be interested in your package. And that could be very helpful. It saves you a lot of time and energy. Right. That, that's a great point. Okay. So w- one more question. Why is it that I like the ones and they're not interested and they're interested and I'm not, what's that about? So that's, that's another hard one. Yeah. I mean, that's just, you know, again, it's all about, you only need one. So you might like some, they don't like you. And that's, that's the process of dating and, and rejection hurts. It does hurt, but you only need one. And when the right one comes along, you're both going to really like each other. So I'm going to jump in and just say that there is an interesting phenomenon that happens when I'm really excited about somebody and I like them, whether or not I like their personality or their intelligence or their look, whatever I like about them, I get a little excited. I get a little eager and I, and I, and I talk more, or I, I show more eye contact or I show more interest without realizing it. And for some people that could be a turnoff, you know? So if a girl is like very excited about a guy, is he going to like me? And she's trying so hard because she really likes him. He often gets like, whoa. What's going don't, on? Here? Don't this try too hard. Don't try too hard. Exactly. Yeah. And then vice versa, where like, you know, I'm not trying to play hard to get, but I don't, I'm not, I don't really like him. I'm not really into him. And he's thinking like, I got to chase her. I got to try to get her. Right. So he's like liking you when you're not really into him and you're like, go away. Why? And the more you do that, the more he wants you. Cause he like, it's the, it's the, you know, the chase it's exciting. Well, I want to get this girl. I can't get. So that's why sometimes this happens. So if you really, really like a guy, don't show it just go chill, just go easy, you know, don't become too eager, don't get too smothering, don't text and call and and be constantly like on top of him. It's a turnoff. It's just completely a turnoff. So girls have to be able to hold themselves back. Guys also don't know how to like not smother sometimes when they're excited about someone. Right. So I agree with one point, but I, I'm going to say something else. Go for it. I love what you're saying that, you know, don't overdo it. Don't be too eager. But you do have to show if you like somebody because oh, of you have to you have to express 
you know, your that's feelings. later when there's a little bit more of an understanding of like, I like you and you like me, let's try to build this relationship. I'm talking about in the beginning when I just met you and I'm like, so excited. This is exactly the kind of look I'm looking for. And people act so eager. What do you mean? I went on two dates and he said, no, how could he said no? Right. So that kind of thing where people just get like, so forlorn that that didn't, didn't work out. So there has to be a fine balance. Like don't overdo it one way or the other, you know? Yeah. In the Miriam, beginning, once you're in the relationship, once though, you're, of course, once you're yeah. in the relationship, you need to open up to create that vulnerability, right. to create that connection and to move it forward hundred percent. Miriam, you had mentioned about the head, right? Leading with the head and then obviously right. investing in the heart. And I wanted to just, you know, quickly, cause we don't have time really to go into right. it any further, but just talk about the hand. Right. And so, um, I, I, typically would explain to my secular non from students about, you know, what is shidduch dating? So I would say, basically, it's you start with your head, think about does this person make sense for me? And if I look into them and they look into me, then I'll go on a date because this makes sense. And then I see, is there chemistry? Am I, you know, am I attracted to them? Do I like their company? And then the last thing is hand, is nagia, right? And so I find that um, in today's um, dating world, there are some people who, feel like they can't wait or they don't want to wait or they don't care about it or they just need to be able to reach out and touch this person. Um, and so I wanted to just briefly hear your opinion about it. I wanted to just briefly speak about it myself, not from a from perspective. I don't want to come from like halacha or any of that. I don't want to come from that angle. I want to come from the angle of, you know, when we are physically connected to somebody, it's a gift to be married and have that in a marriage is, is a gift. And Mr. Shem, everybody will get there. But when we introduce it too early, what it does is it actually releases oxytocin in the brain, right? Oxytocin is a hormone that's released when a mother is feeding her child and when a husband and wife are together. It's and a bonding hormone. It's a bonding hormone. And yeah. it's a great thing when you're bonded to the right person. But before you know if this and is the, the right And at the right person, time, right person at the, at right, the right, right time. Exactly, and right time. But before you know that this is the right person, you could be very well bonding yourself to someone that you don't want to be bonding yourself to. And this is so very, very dangerous. So I'm just, I just put out there as like a warning, A, a warning to the girls. If I'm hearing that, like you mentioned before, he just wants to sit in the car. He doesn't want to go anywhere. I'm thinking like, why does he not want to go anywhere? What's going on in the car, right? Get out of the car, okay? If you're giving, giving him reason to stay in the car, he won't leave the car, okay? So that would be A. And B is um, you wouldn't go into an interview drunk, right? You would make sure to be sober. You wouldn't go into dating and choosing your life partner high on oxytocin because that wouldn't be the most helpful way to you know, um, make the biggest decision of your life. Be smart, bond yourself to somebody wonderful, but first decide if they are right for you. And then we can decide in the right time to bond ourselves to them. Um, in addition, and, and then I wanna turn it over to you, when we have a beautiful relationship a beautiful couple that's building something and it's really going forward and it's really connecting and they're opening up and they're sharing emotionally and becoming vulnerable. Sometimes they think like, Ooh, let's just like, what would happen if I just like leaned over and gave this person a hug? It's not that big a deal. What they don't realize is it starts to chip away at the respect that one has for the other person. And slowly I thought I could trust you because I thought you were this kind of person, but maybe you're not. So if I can't trust you here, maybe I can't trust you there. And then all of a sudden it chips away at the respect. And before you know, the relationship starts to unravel and becomes much more focused on the physical than all the great things it was building before that. And it's very, very sad to watch couples unravel their beautiful relationships over something that could so easily have been avoided. Um, and I'm just putting it out there because when I have girls calling me crying, I don't know, I've been dating him for eight months and he can't figure out if he wants to marry me. And I say, are you Shomer Gia? And they're silent. Well, I know the reason why he's it's still dragging on for that long, because if you're going to let it drag on for that long, and frankly, this whole area, whether we like it or not, is really very much in the hands of the woman. OK, so if a woman is going to allow boundaries to be crossed, then he will think it's OK and boundaries will be crossed and there will be repercussions to that either he'll just have a good time and then just to be like, I don't want to be with a girl like that, that kind of girl who would do that. I don't want that as a mother of my children. I'm going to move on to another girl. Right. And girls He's just having a good her. time with you. Exactly. Yeah. He's just having a fun time, but you allowed it, but you allowed it. Right? right. So it's so, so difficult to keep to, but if we're able to hold on tight, we'll find that we'll get commitment faster. We'll get clarity faster and we'll be able to be bonded to the right person at the right time for the biggest decision of our life. Right. So first of all, thank you for bringing that up, that very important topic. I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up. 
I don't have too much to add to that because you really explained it very well. I just want to like add two points. It's not really adding, it's just, you know, elaborating a little that um, you sometimes may feel pressured. You think the guy is only going to like me if I give in. But once you give in, like Rachel said, he'll, he'll lose respect for you and you'll lose respect for yourself. And then if you're bonding, you're not, it's not a real bond. It's not a real connection because it's all the hormones that are blinding you. So again, it has nothing to do with halacha or, you know, from kite or anything. It's just not, not a good idea. It's just not smart dating practices. It's not smart dating practices. I'm the right person. Exactly. But I, I want to say something and this, it's, it's going to sound like I'm sort of contradicting myself, but I'm not. You know, when girls come and tell me that they're dating, 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 but they don't feel that spark. They they really like the guy. Everything makes sense. They enjoy their company, but there's something missing. This is the thing that could be missing. And for many girls, after the wedding, after the chuppah, they say, you know what? This is what I was missing, that physical touch. For guys, yes, they want the physical touch. But when they look at a woman, they know if they're going to, you know, that they, they, they know if there's going to be that connection for the woman she needs that physical touch but you can't give into it but if everything else checks out and there's that tiny tiny little bit missing it could be that it's just this and so many people like once they're married it all falls into place but again i want to reiterate that everything else has to check out like you have to really enjoy their company you have to like them love them all that has to be there and then the deeper connection, the deeper feelings, the spark that most girls are looking for, that'll fall into place after. Yeah. Anyway, so we're pretty much out of time. But Rachel, I want you to just give some, you know, closing thoughts to all these beautiful people over here. What do you, what do you want to tell everybody? You know, we're going into Rosh Hashanah. And uh, as we all know, you know, Rosh Hashanah is a day that all you know, Shaduchim are made and a Kaddish Baruch decides for the year what's going to happen. And so um, I'll share a little kind of family heirloom story. Uh, my grandfather was uh, standing in line in the concentration camps waiting to be killed. And what does a person do when they're waiting to be shot? You know, so he's saying Vidoy, he's saying Animamen, he's saying Shema. He finished all his davening. He didn't have anything else that he off the top of his head could say. And he's looking around and he said, you know what? I'm going to march myself to the front of the line. And let's see what happens. He marches himself to the front of the line and he gives like, you know, high salutes to the commander. And he says, you know, we're not hungry. We're, we're not, we're not sick here. We're just starving. If you'll just give us another piece of bread and you'll just give us, you know, another bowl of soup, we will do whatever you want. Why would you kill a hundred other able-bodied men, right? There were a hundred people in line with him. And the commander thought about it. And he sent all those hundred men back to the barrack. In that line was my, my grandfather who asked. It was also my other grandfather, right? It was my mother's father and it was my father's father who didn't even know that their children would later be getting married, which were my parents, right? And so my grandfather ends the story. He always says, if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah. We're coming before Rosh Hashanah to Kaddish Baruch Hu, You need to ask. You need to beg, beg, beg. And ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give us what we need. And sometimes it's hard to hear that a year has gone by and Hashem decided that this was the year not for you to get married. We all want to hear about when it's the year for us to get married. But sometimes Hashem decides it's not the year for you to get married. And all those years that I daven and it didn't happen were such painful years. I thought I daven such a good davening this year. Why didn't it happen to me? And I saw over my years of being single that there were things that I had to work through. There are things that I had to grow in. There are things that I had to mature in because if I didn't, I would not have been ready to marry my husband. My husband had been married for 10 years. He, you know, uh, lived a whole full life. He was a, a rabbi on campus doing Kirov for 11 years on University of Maryland campus, right? If I had never had any relationship experience under my belt, how would I be able to marry somebody who had been in a relationship for, you know, 10 plus years, right? So being able to accept that what Hashem is doing for us is good, even when it doesn't feel good, that real bitachon work is so, so challenging, but be, being able to say, Hashem, I'm completely in your hands and I know that you know what's good for me. Not the shatrin, not the parents, not the family. They don't know what's good for me, but a Kaddish Baruch who knows what's good for you. If we're able to really accept that this Rosh Hashanah and be able to take our pain, pour it into you know, tears of tefillos, not just for yourself, but for all of your friends that are single too. I have lists of people that I daven for. 
um, to be able to do that and come to Rosh Hashanah and say, listen, I've done everything that I can. I've asked, I've tried, I've begged. And if a Kaddish Baruch decided that this year is not the year to get married, because I never liked when people said, oh, it's going to be this year. You don't know that. Don't tell me it's going to be this year. How do you know, right? It takes many years sometimes to build maturity. You know, like when my parents said, you didn't marry, you didn't marry a boy, you married a man. It takes many years to build a man. And I waited for all those years, right? And so when you actually meet him or her, you'll realize why you had to wait all that time. But the waiting is so, so hard. And the only one who could really understand that pain is a Kaddish Baruch Hu. So I really encourage you to take it and turn it towards your, your sitter this uh, Arab Rosh Hashanah. And I'm certainly davening for everyone out there. And um, it's just my little bit to be able to give back to singles, understanding what it feels like. And um, it's been such an honor to be here with you, Miriam. Thank you so much. That was that was really beautiful and so heartfelt. Um, I just want to add one little thing to what Rachel so eloquently said. You know, Yeshua Sashem Kaharifayan, it can happen literally in the blink of an eye. So my my advice to all of you is don't give up. It could happen in 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 a minute. From one second to the next, you'll get a phone call with a suggestion. It can really happen. But if you like sort of give up and you're living a life in, in despair, you're you have like a certain vibe around you. So you, you're not allowing the Shefa. The you're not allowing the Bracha to come in. Exactly. Don't give up. You know, I know it's hard. And if you have a bad day, the next day will be better. But remember that in a blink of an eye, Hashem can make it happen. So all you need to do is just ask. Beautiful. Thank you, Rachel. This was so awesome. And I want to oh, say, I, I know that some, some people like, you know, more people wrote questions. I will try to answer some of them later. So Miriam, but, why don't you tell us a little bit about where we can reach you if we want to contact you? Um, You know, what? You is there a me? way to, to put it in, in a chat box? You could just tell us your, your website or your. Oh so, yeah. So um, you can all reach me. All my information is on my website, which is miriamzeitlincoaching.com. And it has all my information on that. And Rachel, tell us as well, you know, if anybody wants to reach out to her, how can they reach so her? So you can reach me at um, dategrade.com, D8GR8.com or Rachel, R-E-C-H-E-L at D8GR8.com. And again, all my information is on the website. You can find videos online. You can, you know, Google me or go to my blog or whatever it is that uh, you'd like to uh, to do. And this has been so much fun, Mary. Yeah, this has been amazing. So I apologize if we couldn't answer all the questions. I'll try to answer them. You know, I'm, I'm able to see the chat still, but it's been lovely and have a wonderful night. And to everybody who's watching, have a Kasiva Vechasima Tova.